This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report.
All right. Well, welcome to those of you in the room. Um, thank you for participating in person. For those of you on Zoom, um, lovely to have you on our Zoom. And uh, we will be monitoring questions um, over the Zoom chat as we have in the past. Um, so really excited to welcome you to the McLean Lecture Series um, on Gender Equity and Ethics. Um, and today, um, as you know, we have Dr. Monica Peake, one of our internal speakers, um, talking with us. Um, we're really excited to have her. And I will go ahead and introduce her now and get her started. And then I'll summarize um, the, the future of our winter quarter series um, at the end of her talk. Um, so Dr. Peake is the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice, the Associate Vice Chair for Research Faculty Development in the Department of Medicine, and Executive Medical Director of Community Health Innovations, the Associate Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translational Research, and the Director of Research slash the Associate Director of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. She's a renowned health services researcher, bioethicist, and internist focused on health equity. Her research concentrates on promoting equitable doctor-patient relationships among racial minorities, integrating medical and social needs of patients, and addressing the impacts of structural racism on health outcomes. She has public, uh, published extensively on social determinants of health, health disparities, and healthcare education. Dr. Peake has served on the National Advisory Council of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the National Executive Council of the American Diabetes Association, the National Council of the Society of General Internal Medicine, and the International Board of Directors for Physician and Human Rights. She was a planning committee member of the National Academy's workshop series on evolving crisis standards of care and lessons from COVID-19. Additionally, she helped uh, develop the COVID-19 crisis standards of care for the state of Illinois and was a member of Mayor Lori, Lightfoot, Lori Lightfoot's racial equity rapid response team. She is a consultant to CME Outfitters where she leads nationwide uh, innovative des um, design to prov provide health equity education to clinicians. Dr. Pe Peek received her MD from John Hopkins University, her MPH from Hopkins University, and um, earned her MSc from the University of Chicago. In 2022, Peek was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, which is considered to be one of the highest honors in the field of health and medicine. So welcome Dr. Peek, um, we're excited to have you today. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. So I am, uh, for those of you who came to the McLean conference, it's pretty much the same talk. <laughs> Just a little slower um, and I've added some slides. Um, for those of you who didn't, uh, then this will be um, all new and interesting, hopefully. Um, and so I'll also try and keep it an eye on time. We have until 1.15 or so. Okay, so uh, most of this series is about gender. And I think I may be one of the only ones who are doing taking an intersectional approach and thinking about gender and race. And so... Um, so I'm going to be focusing on Black women, um, but there are a lot of people who sit at lots of different intersections of gender um, and other marginalized identities. So a lot of what I'm talking about could apply to lots of other people um, who carry around multiple marginalized identities um, and how that may relate to clinical ethics. So I first always want to start by just acknowledging and thanking the places that I sit on campus. Um, many of are all of which <laughs> Julie named, thank you. Um, it really is a, a pleasure to be able to work um, in so many different capacities here at the university with so many colleagues. So I always also like to start with a definition of clinical medical ethics. Um, and that is, so just a level set, and that's a, a medical field that helps patients families and health professionals reach good clinical decisions by taking into account the medical details of the situation, the patient's personal preferences, values, socioeconomic considerations, and ethical concerns. It examines the practical ethical concerns that arise routinely in encounters among patients, families, healthcare professionals, and healthcare institutions. So it is um, not only what happens between patients and clinicians at the bedside, but it's also considering all of the things in their lived experience and the concerns that come out of the ethical concerns that sort of arise from those situations. 
So again, I, was, uh, I mentioned at the beginning that well, I'm taking sort of an in intersectional approach. And so what does that mean? The term intersectionality um, was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is not like someone from way in the past. She's alive and well and still writing. <laughs> She's a, a current scholar. Um, and uh, she talked, to, so this, this comes out of a body of black feminist thought. Um, and but she talks about the combination of intersecting systems of oppression that perpetuate discrimination and disadvantage based on uh, factors such as race, class, sex, and gender identity. Um, but again, uh, we all have multiple social identities, um, and there can be multiple ways in which these identities intersect. Um, and we know that uh, that people who have who are multiply marginalized, let's say, uh, for example, uh, Black trans women. That group has gotten a lot of uh, public attention nationally recently, um, are probably right now the most marginalized population um, in the country. They have increased rates of homelessness so much, um, uh, hate crimes and violence um, against them. And it's not just because of one of their identities, it's because of all of their identities sort of combined at one time. Um, and so people who have more than one marginalized social identity are at more than just the usual risk of health disparities, both mental and physical. And so social identities are important for lots of reasons. They're not just who we are and expressions of who we are and, and how we manifest in the world, but they also reflect the amount of social power that we have, and that's important because it helps us navigate smoothly or less smoothly in the world, and that translates into health outcomes. That's why I'm talking about it as a physician. Um, and so these are, again, just a list of some of the kinds of identities that people carry and the, the ones that I'm talking about today, uh, race, ethnicity, and gender, and also gender identity, um, although I'm gonna focus on gender. Um, and, there's also obviously sexual orientation, age, ability or disability, age, immigration status, indigenous persons or nationality, primary language, income class, so many others. Um, and again, uh, it's important because uh, it, of its, its ties to social power. Um, and we know that um, the inequities in our society are not sort of randomly occurring. They occur specifically across fault lines based on these marginalized social identities. So um, who is more likely to be on the wrong side of the power um, or to be on the fault line for these inequities are those who have less social power. So um, if you um, are of a race that has more social power, um, then you're gonna have fewer inequities that you face. Um, and so, and so again, these things are, are more than additive. And so that's why they're important. So um, I, my father was a, a black history professor. Um, and so I grew up understanding not just the importance of history in general, but the importance of everything having a historical context and to um, always be contextual and to always be historical, no matter where you are. And so, as a health services researcher, as a bioethicist, as a clinician, I'm also a historian. <laughs> my dad passed away in 2015, but I felt like he would be really proud of me. In my day-to-day -day life, so much of what I do is what he did <laughs> as a history professor, um, is, is talk about history, um, because it really informs who we are today as a country. So much today as a country, it informs who we are. Um, and it can tell us where we're going. And particularly if we don't have that sense, if we are, if we are operating in a vacuum, if we're acting ahistorically, like we somehow just landed here, um, then we're bound to make the same mistakes. And one of the things that I think is most frightening is that our country is really trying to make sure that we're ahistorical. We are trying to make sure that children um, don't read an accurate sense of history, that we are you know, actively trying to erase our history. Um, and that is something that other countries have not chosen to do. Um, 
when, when thinking about their own history and trying to learn from their mistakes as a country. And I think it's particularly dangerous for us as a country. Um, so back to thinking about this intersection of race and gender uh, for black women in our country, in the South, there is this history, this, this bizarre history of sex crimes um, that really has put racial equity and gender equity at odds with each other. And what I mean by that is that black and white people have been having sex for hundreds of years. Um, what was routinely happening is that the white masters were having sex with the women, um, raping the women um, and having offspring who would then be slaves. Um, a lot of times those slaves would live in the house um, and you know have a, a better standard of living. And that has created sort of this sense of colorism that has perpetuated today because the lighter skinned um, slaves had more um, advantages, they had an easier life, they had more access to resources than the darker skinned slaves who had to work out in the field in the hot sun, backbreaking labor. And so the, the closer you were to whiteness, the more advantages you have. And that colorism persists across this country and across the world because the same kinds of racial oppression um, or colonization have exist across the world. But, what, but those kinds of sexual activity, those weren't crimes. That was just business as usual. It was considered a crime when black men had sex with white women. That almost never happened. But it was talked about in such a way that you thought it was happening all the time. Um, when it happened, um, it was usually because, like the men, that because black people had no control over their own bodies. They weren't willing to risk getting killed for, you know, they were the, the enslaved. It would be because the master's wife would order a man to come have sex. And if they were caught, then she would say, oh my God, I've been raped. And then the man would get killed. So these, so that became a sex crime. And after slavery, when there was really no motivation to value black lives, because during slavery, uh, lives had a, a black people had a monetary value on their life because they were enslaved and could be brought, bought and sold. Then uh, that is when you saw the rise of the Klan, um, of a lot of militia, of a lot of pushback um, to try and keep black people back in their place who were trying to just be free, right? And so the government, the federal government was trying to help build a lot of schools and help um, you know, you know, educate freed slaves and get them into government. And they were promised 40 acres and a mule. I'm sure you've probably heard about that. You know, nobody got that. Um, and the white people were actively trying to keep any of that from happening. And they were terrorizing all of the black people. And one of the ways they did this was by frequently saying, uh, that black men had been raping white women as an excuse for lynching them I mean, and causing terror in the community. And so these, these, these fabricated sex crimes um, that uh, were a major source of tension. Um, and so uh, white mobs uh, often use these dubious criminal accusations to justify the, the, the very frequent lynchings. And a common claim was used uh, a common claim used to lynch black men was the perceived sexual transgressions against white women. Charges of rape were routinely fabricated. These allegations were used to enforce segregation and advance the stereotype of black men as violent, hypersexual aggressors. These, this here is a picture of Emmett Till um, and the woman who accused him, who's still alive as far as I know. Um, and recently in the past, I don't know, five to 10 years, she admitted that she um, lied, <laughs> that she, was not telling the truth when she said that he had whistled at her. Just the whistling at her um, got him killed. Um, but Emmett Till was not from the South. He was from Chicago, he lived right around here. Um, and so his mother was not trained to live in the South to you know, put her head down and to accept those circumstances. She said, oh no, <laughs> I am going to let the world know what just happened to my son. 
And so there was, she called all the national newspapers. Everybody came, she had an open casket. And that was like an international shock and sensation to see exactly what happened and what was happening in the South to black people. Um, for the crime of whistling at a white woman, which actually hadn't even happened. And so it was, and that spurred, you know, a lot of activity and, and motion. It's these kinds of things that, you know, set the foreground for the civil rights movement. Um, but this link or this, this being at odds of the power that white women had over the lives and well being of Black communities. Black men in particular, but the entire Black communities, um, put those two communities at odds um, for generations. And that power persists today. And so the example is the, the two Coopers, unrelated. Um, Christian Cooper, the birder, uh, who was in Central Park, um, and Amy Cooper, um, the non-birder, <laughs> who was there with her dog, unleashed. And uh, Christian said, can you uh, put a leash on your dog because I'm trying to watch the birds. And she said, I'm going to tell them, I'm going to call the police because, you know, I know what police do to black men if I call them and tell them that there's an African man threatening my life. And she did call the police. Thankfully, um, unlike many times that we've all seen on TV, um, he was not beaten to death. He was not arrested. He was not shot without questions being asked, he managed to, you know, get away with, with his life. She ended up, you know, having her dog taken away temporarily. She was fired from her job, but that situation almost never happens like that. She entered that situation because she knew that all the cards were in her favor for her having a good outcome and for him having a very bad outcome. Um, and so that power dynamic um, is one that persists today and one that has made it a challenge for Black women who are facing both sexism and racism to fully be a part of social movements that are fighting both of those things. And again, we think about the sort of the context because we, people and patients bring all of that with them to the clinical encounter. And we do as well as physicians. And so when we think about uh, so we'll start with sort of racism within the gender movement, within anti-sexism. And so the women's suffrage movement um, had a lot of Black women that were in it, um, but they were asked to be at the back of the marches and to be quiet in the marches. And um, I had, uh, I'm had i a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. We were very prominent um, and we were very proud that we were part of the suffrage movement, I, not me personally, but my sorority was, and we have all these, you know, historical pictures, black and white photos, just like that of us, you know, being part of, but what we don't have pictures of is us sort of being at the back of the line. You know, we don't, <laughs> nobody wanted to see that. We just have these photos of us being present, but we were asked like everyone else was like the headquarters of colored women voters were to, to, to be quietly involved in the movement and to not speak up. And it was in 1851 that Sojourner Truth spoke out at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention um, and said, you know, we're women too. Aren't I, you know, it was later transcribed into um, the ain't I a woman speech, but her first language was French. And so she probably wasn't saying ain't I a woman. But anyway, was, she was making the claim that I'm also a woman who is fighting for women's rights to vote. Why is it that I'm not allowed to speak freely about this issue because of the color of my skin? Because um, way back when, all the way up to you know, issues of the Me Too movement um, and our thinking about that primarily as a, you know, starting out as sort of a white women's actress movement and then everyone else saying, hey, that happened to me, Me Too, Me Too, um, but not fully addressing the women who have been most marginalized and probably most victimized, who had the least amount of voice uh, during those processes, and those are women of color, um, we don't hear their voices as much as part of that movement. Um, and then um, this is Angela Davis, who most of us remember when she was young and vibrant and had the big Afro and the big you know, hoop earrings. 
she is still alive and, and, and kicking and still talking about, you know, solidarity and socialism. Um, and she had said in Madrid, you know, feminism is going to have to make a choice. We're either going to be anti-racist or we're not, but we cannot keep this kind of hedging our bets and, you know, whatever. We know, we understand that there is a lot of power associated with being white, that there's a lot of power and privilege. But at some point, we're going to have to say in solidarity with all of the women color, or, uh, women of color around the world that we're going to, you know, have to be anti-racist or like, or, or not, you know, and so that, that tension is, is something that has always been there. Then there is, has also been historically some sexism within the anti-racism movement. Um, and so this is a film that was made um, in Berlin, sort of um, highlighting some of the black women that were really critical to the civil rights movement. It's called Reflections Unheard, Black Women in the Civil, black women in civil Rights. And it talks about some of the, the lesser known stories of black women's political organization um, between the sort of male dominant black power movement um, and the predominantly white and middle-class feminist movement during the 1960s and 70s. And the resulting mobilization um, and sort of coming together of black women and other women of color. Um, and that's, how the term womanist came out as opposed to feminist, um, sort of this, this alternative uh, theoretical way of being. All right, so now <laughs> I'm gonna tack a little bit now that we have sort of our historical and contextual framework for thinking about how these things have um, historically affected people in their lives, have been at odds with communities, how these things um, then come to impact patients and physicians. We always think that physicians, um, once we put on our white coat, this is pink, but <laughs> that we um, you know, are doing the very best we can and we are trying, but you know, there's just such a, a huge body of evidence that we all have biases, every one of us, myself included. Um, if we just take that implicit association test, we'll find out which ones we have. Um, and not only that, but how we work and where we work puts us at increased risk for using those implicit biases because it's the time pressures, the high, the high cognitive demand, the uncertainty, we don't have all the answers. Okay, Care Everywhere has made that easier <laughs> than when I was a resident and it was 3 a.m. and you couldn't get the records faxed over. Um, we still have limited resources, but it's still that, you know, it's a race against time to get the right answer with people who, you know, may be sedated or the family's not there or they don't speak the language and you don't have the interpreter. And so how do you get to the right answer with not all the right information, and you have to make a decision. Um, and so we, a lot of times, will rely more heavily on what we think might be happening. And what we think might be happening may bear no resemblance at all to what is happening. Um, but it's those stereotypes and biases that are sort of baked into how we have learned to think about people and populations that come to the front. There's this study that was done in the New England Journal of Medicine like 20 years ago. Um, not using real people, just pictures of people. And it, uh, the, the, the right answer was to recommend, to, to recommend people who with chest pain and these EKG and echo findings for cardiac catheterization. And if you were black, you had 60% uh, of the odds of being recommended for a cath. If you were a woman, you had 60% of the odds of being recommended for a cath. But if you were a black woman compared to the white man, you had only 40% of the odds of being recommended for a cardiac catheterization. And so that's really important to be able to see that interactive effect of race and gender. What we have an extreme shortage of now are studies that actually look at the interactive effects of race and gender. What you'll see when you look at the titles of studies, they'll say age and, I'm sorry, they'll say race and gender, um, of you know, this kind of cancer, but what they'll do is um, do black versus white differences and male versus female differences, but they won't look at the interactive effects of race and gender. 
almost never. And I actually just looked again today to make sure that there wasn't like a whole bunch of literature that just came out. And so I'm like, no, Dr. Peek, something was. Um, so we really, really need to be able to look more carefully um, because there is that interactive effect. We do know that, you know, Black women do worse, but we don't have as rich of a body as we should have um, because we're not looking, we're not stratifying our analysis by both race and gender. And when we're doing regression models, we're not doing interactive effects by race and gender as frequently as we could and should. So this was a, a study, a qualitative study by um, Tina Sachs, who was a PhD candidate here um, and SSA, and she wrote a book. Um, and so this is what Amazon says about her book. Um, it challenges the idea that race and gender discrimination, particularly in healthcare settings, is a thing of the past. And that questions, uh, and it questions the persistent myth that discrimination only affects poor racial minorities. In so doing, the book expands our understanding of how black middle-class women are treated when they go to the doctor, why they continue to face inequities in securing proper medical care, and what strategies they use to fight for the best treatment. So this enters class into the equation. So we have race and gender, but we also have class. And so what? The, so this is important for several reasons. Um, one is to say that despite where you are along the class spectrum, you are still gonna be exposed to racism. And when, you, when we do studies and look at people who report the most racism, it is frequently the people who are of the highest SES because we're like, well, it can't be that I'm poor because I'm not, you know? So it's not that I don't have insurance or income or that my clothes are shabby or that I smell bad or that I'm homeless or that, you know, like, like, okay, well, what else is left other than my brown skin or black skin, you know? And so it's usually the upper middle class to, to higher class persons or higher income persons that are more likely to report discrimination and racism. Um, than those of the lower income populations, because there's so many things that could be working against them um, to be causing poor treatment. The other thing that I just want to put out there, because a, a race and class are so frequently entangled, and people are like, you know, if we could just disentangle them, you know, if, if Black people could just stop being poor, if we could just get that, that, you know, that poverty out the way, then Black people would be the same as whites. So like when you adjust for class, many of the differences go away. <laughs> yes, many of them do go away. But what I would argue and what is important again is for us not to be ahistorical. How is it that those two got so entangled in the first place? <laughs> is because we started out enslaved with no money and worked that way for 400 years and then had no money to give for intergenerational wealth and that there were laws and policies put in place to give money for GIs who are white but not black and that there were laws to keep black people in these poor little neighborhoods that had no resources. That there, you know, there's just been a machine that had been built and has kept running to crush the lives, hopes, and dreams of you know, black and brown people to, the, to this day, you know? And so that is why black people disproportionately are more poor and you cannot disentangle the two. And so to only, you know, to adjust out for income is to adjust out for one of the major mechanisms by which racism works. And so, yes, it would be great if black people could just stop being poor, but that takes more than just Black people pulling themselves up by the bootstraps. It takes an addressment of systemic inequities. It takes an undoing of that machine that has been clobbering us for you know decades, for hundreds of years, um, in order for that to happen. And so, I, I, that's my little pet peeve. So I'm sorry, <laughs> but I just have to say that um, that you know that class is a huge thing, and that as scientists and health services researchers were, were frequently so quick to, you know, adjust for class and adjust for income and adjust for, 
you know, these things when for education, when, when so frequently they are the means by which um, marginalized people are kept oppressed. So this is a, a study that was done, and I apologize for not including the citation, of obesity, race, and class in the United States. So this is all women. And what we see on the bottom line is that the higher income women have lower BMIs and the lowest income women have the highest BMIs and then middle in the middle. So that makes sense. Um, when we, oops, wrong way. Uh, when we look at black and white women, there's a little bit of a difference. So the white women are on the top and you see that in general, their pattern is pretty much the same, that the lower income women have the highest BMIs, the richer women on the bottom. But when you look at the black women, what you'll see is that the low income women have sort of a flattening, a sort of a flat lining, and that the middle and high income women continue to increase so that over time they have bypassed the low income women and be have become much more obese than the lower income women. And so there are factors other than class that are contributing to the obesity epidemic amongst middle and high income women who are African-American. Um, and that they are significantly more obese than white women. Part of this may be that a lot of interventions have been targeted towards low income uh, black women. Part of this may be the additional perceptions of stress. And we know how perceptions of racism and stress change the physiology. Um, and those perceptions are more likely to occur in upper income women, as I just mentioned. There, there are probably a lot of reasons to, to unpack this, but I just wanted to show it to you. because <laughs> I think it's very interesting. So this is a research uh, study that was just done a year and a half, a year? Yeah, about a year and a half ago. And it looks specifically at black white disparities in women's physical health and the role of socioeconomic status and racism related stressors. Again, keep in mind what I just said about socioeconomic status. And so um, we know that there's significant disparities in black and white health outcomes for women, part of which is explained by SES or class. And what this study did was it added measures of racism, discrimination, um, overcriminalization, adverse neighborhood conditions, et cetera. And those two together accounted for 90% of the disparity in self-rated physical health. And for those of you who are not health services researchers, um, we use self-rated physical health, not just because it's like easy to survey, <laughs> because it is, but because it's also been validated um, against real morbidity and mortality, with the exception perhaps of my own mother, who's a hypochondriac. Um, but for most people, um, if you ask them about, if you ask them to rate their own health as, you know, fair, good, you know, very good or excellent, um, that actually matches with what will happen currently and in the future as far as their own morbidity and mortality. Same thing with mental health. So it is um, easy to do, easier than like looking in everyone's electronic medical record, um, but also is a valid assessment tool of someone's health. Um, and when they looked at the measures by a survey of, do you have these kinds of chronic diseases? They didn't ask an exhaustive list. Um, it accounted for 50% of the disparity and the prevalence of the diseases that they did ask. And here's a table that no one can read, um, but does show in the top of the box, the chronic health conditions and the fair slash poor uh, reported physical health status and that they were statistically significant. And then this is a study um, that looked at perceived discrimination in health-related quality of life, gender differences um, between um, older African-Americans. So now we're looking at uh, gender differences between people of the same race. And um, this was uh, some of our friends in town, Lisa Barnes, right at uh, Rush, Elizabeth Jacobs used to be here, uh, here at UFC and then at Rush, and then now she's, I don't know where she is now, she's in Maine. Anyway, um, more women reported in a poor overall health-related quality of life than men, um, and that higher perceived discrimination was related to worse overall health-related quality of life with stronger effects for women 
um, overall and in mental health related quality of life, although there were no gender differences found in physical health related quality of life. So we see that there are ev there's evidence um, of gender related differences within a race. There's evidence of race related differences within a gender um, for black women. And then we know sort of the historical context of why some of that might be. One of the things I wanna talk about, since many of our guests have, I'm sure talked a lot, <laughs> or will be talking about gender and methods and, and how that works is why does, how, why does racism cause poor health? That's usually like a whole lecture in itself. I got one slide. <laughs> so lots of, lots of mechanisms, but limitations to access to healthcare and health promoting goods and services, um, like healthy food, excellent schools, um, opportunities for education, et cetera. Those things um, that are, you know, what we call structural racism, limited access to healthy environments, neighborhoods, safe and stable housing. Um, think about all the houses with all the lead paint and the kids eating the paint and then what that does for their cognitive development. Think, and so like Baltimore, Chicago, all of these old houses filled with lead paint. And when, when I moved into my condo with my kids, they weren't of paint eating age, but you know, there's lead dust around. And I, I, asked, and I asked the people, could I test the water and the, you know, whatever for lead paint? And they're like, you can test if you want, but we're not making any changes. The offer is <laughs> like, are you trying to kill my children? Like, I couldn't even believe it. No, anyway, they want to come back and visit. <laughs> I'm like, anyway, <laughs> congratulations on getting into NAM. Can I get into your, anyway. So uh, we think about what happened in Flint, Michigan, right? All that horrible water that people have been drinking all that time. You know, people need parks and recreation. There's always some breaking news story about toxins. There was one recently, you know, it's causing all this cancer. And of course the company is always saying that there are no health risks. So we don't know anything about that. And then there's a health study that just showed like 10,000 people just died. And, you know, those are always in marginalized communities, very poor communities, usually communities with lots of immigrants or poor people, black people who don't have the social capital to say, no, don't do this. You know, that would never happen in the, in the middle of Lincoln Park, you know, but it will happen in Pilsen as it did, right? Um, it will happen in Gary, Indiana as it did. Um, and so these limited access to healthy environments is one of the ways that structural inequities and structural racism causes poor health. Um, and then just the exposure to the acts of chronic discrimination and not just like the egregious things of like seeing George Floyd being murdered, you know, or your grandfather being lynched. Those are, those are, <laughs> those are the major occurrences, right? But it's actually the, the, the little things that happen every day getting followed around in the store because they think you're trying to steal. So, can I help you? Uh, can I, no, really, really, can I help you? You know, you, someone cutting in front of you in line, you know, so our, I have had to have my hand act like a, a crowbar, be like, I was here first. I, I'm like, this is like something I routinely, do. Why, why is that something I have had to make a part of my routine life, <laughs> you know, where people act like I'm so invisible. I'm a whole person standing right here that they cannot see me, they, they cannot value, they look right through me and will walk right past me. This is 2022, you know, and I have to say, excuse me, I'm next, still to this day, you know, and so those kinds of things, two people have the same seat on the plane, I'm the one who has to get ejected, I, you know, all of these things, 
And one time, I will never forget this day, I was here in Chicago, I had four of those things happen to me in one day. And the last being me almost getting ejected from my plane seat as I was leaving from Chicago. And I was like, I think I'm gonna have a stroke. <laughs> I don't even have high blood pressure, but like, <laughs> I know discrimination causes these horrible things. And, you know, so it changes your biology. It changes your pathophysiology. All that chronic stress um, changes your hypo, uh, I always <laughs> start and then like, mm, your HPA uh, axis, um, you, changes your inflammatory state, your, um, your autonomic system, just all of your, your, your things, it increases your cortisol, your C-reactive protein. And there've been so many studies. And so it, it leads to things like all of the things that I see in practice, that Julie sees in practice, that Deb sees in practice, that Vinny sees in practice, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, um, all these chronic diseases, what I've just come to call the diseases of oppression. Um, because of how they change our body. It also changes our DNA. And there was a study that came out last year or the year before that showed that some of the methylene, methylation changes in, in our DNA that happen can occur. Those same changes can show up not only in our babies, but in our babies' babies. It can be three generations out. And so when we wonder what happens when people leave their poor environments, but their children are still having problems, and then their children are still having problems. Like what is happening? It can be that the, 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 the imprint of all of this racism and poverty and trauma on people tracks with their family over generations. So it's a lot. Then what we're supposed to be talking about today <laughs> is the differential treatment, the implicit or explicit bias within healthcare. So, and that is something that again, regardless of your class, black women are faced with. So we have these high profile cases of people like Serena Williams who postpartum was prothrombotic and had a DVT and a PE, but her nurse said that she, her nurse said that she was crazy. You have a famous patient. You can call them anything, but you're not supposed to call them crazy, right? And we all know how you're supposed to treat like high, <laughs> important people. Anyway, she almost didn't get worked up for her pulmonary embolism. We're thankful she's still alive because she had to advocate for herself. But we, well, for those of us who've seen King Richard, she knows and was taught by her father how to be a good advocate for herself, right? Um, and she had to being a tennis player, because that is, uh, that is a, a crazy field. <laughs> and so she advocated for herself and got herself treated. This, Dr. Moore, probably nobody knew about her except for her patients, um, but became high profile because she put herself on Facebook right before she died. Um, and so if you haven't heard about her, we are all going to listen about her story um, because she, the, was talked about on Democracy Now. And so this is a five minute clip that I'm going to. This is Democracy Now, democracynow.org, the quarantine report. I'm Amy Goodman. As the United States reports world record deaths and hospitalizations from COVID-19 in the final days of 2020, we look at how the pandemic that's ravaged the country this year, has shown stark new light on racism in medical care. We begin with a now viral video recorded by black physician Dr. Susan Moore and posted to her Facebook earlier this month, in which she describes racist treatment by medical staff at a hospital in Indianapolis who did not respond to her pleas for care despite being in intense pain and being a doctor herself. Dr. Moore says she had to beg to receive the antiviral drug remdesivir and pain medication and accuses a doctor at Indiana University Health North Hospital of ignoring her pleas because she was black. This is Dr. Susan Moore, as she summoned the energy to speak from her hospital bed days before she would die. She had an oxygen tube in her nose. 
at that time I'd only received two treatments of the remdesivir. He says, ah, oh, you don't need it. You're not even short of breath. I said, yes, I am. Then he went on to say, you don't qualify. I must have because um, I've gotten two treatments. And then he further stated, you should just go home right now. And I don't feel comfortable giving you any more narcotics. in so much pain from my neck. My neck hurt so bad. I was crushed. He made me feel like I was a drug addict. And he knew I was a physician. I don't take narcotics. I was hurting. So, I spoke to patient advocate who left me wanting. Um, there's not much I can do. So I started asking, send me to another hospital where they can treat me. And if they're not gonna treat me here properly, send me to another hospital. Oh. Next thing I know, I'm getting a stat. CT of my neck with and without contrast. The CT went down a little bit into my lungs and you could see new pulmonary infiltrates, new uh, lymphadenopathy all throughout my neck. And all of a sudden, yes, we will treat your pain. You have to show proof that you have something wrong with you in order for you to get the medicine. I put forward and I maintain, if I was white, I wouldn't have to go through that. The other thing that that white Dr. Bannock said was that if I stayed, that he would send me home Saturday at 10 p.m. in the dark. Who does that? On a week, who does that? This is how black people get killed. When you send them home and they don't know how to fight for themselves. I had to talk to somebody, maybe the media, somebody, to let people know how I'm being treated up in this place. And he gladly told me, I know you're a doctor. So he didn't want the black doctor to have no medicine, nothing. And then, had the nerve to say, it's because of him, the nurse, that I got the medicine. Really? Because of you? No. How about because I had that stat CT in my neck where it showed all of that lymphadenopathy and, and infiltrates? Yeah, you didn't know about that? You didn't get that in report? That's what I said. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. to being black up in here, this is what happens. Dr. Susan Moore died due to complications from COVID-19 on December 20th, just over two weeks after she recorded this video and posted it to her Facebook page. She was 52 years old. Her 19-year-old son, Henry Muhammad, is now left to care for her parents, who are both suffering from dementia. The president and CEO of Indiana University Health issued a statement in response to her death, saying the technical aspects of the treatment she received, quote, may not have shown the level of compassion and respect we strive for in understanding what matters most to patients, unquote. Dr. Moore's chilling message has been compared to the video of George Floyd begging for his life as he was killed by Minneapolis police. When we come back, we'll speak to two leading black women doctors fighting racial disparities in health care. They co-wrote a piece in The Washington Post titled, Say Her Name, Dr. Susan Moore. Stay with us.
This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I need some technical assistance. This one? No? My son is my IT support. <laughs> He's only 14. So um, <clears throat> thank you, Julie. So in the past, and so these last two cases, both Serena Williams and with Dr. Moore, what they complained most about initially was their communications with their healthcare team, right? Um, and so that finally <laughs> gets us into the realm of shared decision-making, clinicians, ethics, but all of this we have to know is coming with us into that room with us. So we think about shared decision-making as having sort of three components, information sharing, deliberation about the pros and cons, and then making a decision about treatment and having an implementation plan. And for medical students, I always just say, it's really your soap note um, where you're thinking about the subjective, the O is really not as relevant, the assessment, and then the plan. For each of these parts of the soap note, it's not just you writing things down, it's you having a bi-directional conversation with a patient and you sharing your thoughts um, about what is happening. So it's not patients like the doctor came in, but I still don't know what's going on. They're running some tests. Can you tell me what's going on? Um, which is um, unfortunately, unfrequently, how patients feel about their care. So um, this is a model um, that tries to sum up what I've been talking about for the past <laughs> hour, which is that there are patients and per, I'm pointing at my screen like you can actually see it. Is there a, do we have, is there a pointer? The mouse is a pointer. Oops. All right, this is beyond my skill level. Oh, so if I do it like, Okay, I'm just going to let you guys um, follow along with what I'm saying. So you have a patient and a provider. They have these little things inside them, which represent all of their social identities. Um, and they have to um, look at each other through these lenses, um, these normative lenses that color their perceptions of what they're seeing and hearing about the person that's sitting in front of them. We ultimately um, want the patient and provider to trust each other um, and their decision-making preferences impact whether or not they'll share in that decision. But part of uh, the goal is to have them listen and hear accurately what the person is trying to actually communicate. Um, and part of that is, um, through building trusting relationships that sort of in safe spaces. Um, here in the middle, there's shared decision-making going on. And if that actually happens, it can enhance things. You see trust is all over this. It can enhance trust, people's self-confidence that they can do the plan, their satisfaction with care, their understanding about their disease, um, and can lead to patients actually being more adherent to the plan of care and managing their disease can lead to more patient-centered care that's delivered, more job satisfaction and culturally, hum culturally uh, cultural humility and culturally competent care, which both can increase and improve health outcomes for marginalized patients. Um, and so patients are sitting within this first little darker blue bubble of the, the clinic, but that clinic is sitting someplace in, the, in a community. And that community is sitting someplace within the society of what is happening in the world today. You know, has a black man just been shot and it's on the news and everyone's talking about it? You know, is the Supreme Court about to come down and weigh in on Roe v. Wade as they did? You know, what is happening in the world around race and gender that are impacting how our patients are going to hear what you're trying to tell them? What baggage are they carrying with them from, from their lived experience 
that impacts what they think you're saying or trying to say? Um, and how can we as providers do a better job of listening to them and their stories, hearing what they're trying to tell us and form better alliances with them to improve their care? So um, this is Dr. Siegler's famous four box method um, to approach ethical decision-making that people go over in case conferences. Um, and I uh, mentioned this because it still hasn't come out yet, um, but there is a paper coming out in the Journal of Clinical Ethics. Peter, maybe you know the status, I don't know. Um, it's out, it's in. Oh, soon, okay. <laughs> because this journal is now housed here at the University of Chicago, woohoo. Um, and so it is, uh, so this is not it, this is still the standard four box method, but it's an expansion of this that tries to incorporate um, elements of thinking about how structural racism and other elements like that can impact not just sort of the contextual features, but how they may interact with the medical indications, patient preferences and quality of life, all of the boxes in ways that are important for us thinking about the ethical case at hand um, and make us more sensitive to um, the true ethical issues that are going on. This is um, a figure that is from a paper, a review paper that Monica Vela led that we just found out like last week was one of the top 100 review papers in that journal. So um, it's been sort of making the rounds on Twitter again. We're super excited. Monica Vela is wonderful. She uh, was here for years and is now um, doing wonderful work at UIC. Um, and really it's talking about uh, implicit bias and how that works in healthcare systems. Um, and with individual physicians and that we can do our best, but really what we need to do to be able to continue to do our best for patients is to have a life, you know, outside the healthcare system that is addressing these social and structural determinants of health within the community and the workplace so that people can have the financial means, equal access to health care, um, education, healthy green spaces, plentiful healthy foods, low rates of violence, housing that's equally spaced and healthy, you know, protections in the workplace, low rates of incarceration, lots of exercise, language that's concordant when they come into healthcare. They can have all of the things that it needs to be mentally and emotionally healthy. You know, everyone should have that. Right now, only some of us have that. And so when only some of us have that, they come into the healthcare system already with so many more advantages. I was just, um, somehow every time I give a talk, <laughs> I end up crying. I was just texting with one of my closest friends who is like this famous journalist. We grew up in the same small town. And turns out he texted me and he's like, oh, I've got to you know, leave on Thursday and I have these symptoms. I think I need Tamiflu and some antibiotics. And I was like, you know, hold your horses. Like well, what's going on? And so I, I said, I think you need these tests. Go to the urgent care. It turns out he's got COVID. Um, but you know, so I helped manage him through all the things because many of the doctors didn't want to order some of the tests he needed. And he needed the treatment. And he's like, the doctor was trying to send me away without it. And I was like, go find the doctor. You have, you know, risk factors that make you, you know. And so he's like, you know, it is so scary when you're sick and you go to the doctor. And I said, you know, think about how many people look like us, but they're not famous like you. Or they don't have a doctor like me on speed diet. And I said, this is just one of the fraction of the ways that our people are getting killed in the healthcare system that's supposed to be taking care of them. You know, and so we need all the good things outside of the healthcare system, which we don't have. And we need all of the best treatment once we get inside the healthcare system. And then 
then we may have a chance at health equity. We may have a fighting chance. So I'm gonna end there, just reminding us about what clinical medical ethics is and encouraging us all to remember to be historical and contextual when we see our patients, to think about not only the experiences that they have lived through, but what their parents and their parents have lived through. You know, it, history is a, is a strange thing. You know, like when you're very young, 10 years ago seems like a lifetime away. You know, I was born in 1969, like right around the time that, you know, King and, you know, all these people were getting shot. And, but it seemed like the civil rights movement was like something in the 1900, 1800, you know, just like so far away, you know, but the older I get, I realize what just a, a wrinkle in time this has been, you know, how much progress we have made but how fragile that progress has been and how quickly um, it can be eroded. We've already learned that lesson with Roe v. Wade. And um, there are other lessons that many people are ready to teach us around racial equality, given the opportunity. And so, um, I'll, I'll stop there because I always like to leave time for questions and I'm supposed to stop officially at 1.15. So we have, I have 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> you, if you always cry, I'm always inspired by your talks. Every time I learn something from you and it really helps me grow as a clinician. So I really appreciate that. Um, and the one thing I was thinking from this talk is I, I had really not heard the term colorism before. And I was just thinking of my reflecting on my practice and wondering like how does that affect healthcare? Does it, you know, how should I be more aware, you know, as a physician? So I don't know if you have perspective on that, that that concept of colorism and how it, you know, gets into healthcare. Yeah, you know, there was a study that was done. I don't know who did it. Um, I was listening to it on NPR. And they were saying that a darker skin person, if they are like wearing all the symbols of like, you know, a Gucci bag, step out of a Mercedes, like, you know, like affluence and they have, you know, a beautiful face and they, you know, whatever. But if their skin is dark, you know, people will still associate them with poverty with being dirty, with crime, with all of these other things, more so than with someone who is lighter skinned and may have none of those associations. Um, there's a study that Kamara Jones uh, did many years ago um, that looked at the difference again in self-reported health between um, minorities who looked like minorities and minorities who looked like they were white um, because, you know, um, there are many who, especially right after slavery, who could pass for white and who did. They had to make their, and there's a movie about that in Netflix, um, who made very difficult choices to leave their families behind um, for their own opportunities. Um, and those people had much better health than the minorities who looked like they were black significantly better health. Not as good as those who are white, but significantly better than those who are darker skinned and looked like they were black. Um, and it's a reflection of what happens when other people see you and react to the color of your skin and how you look. So we can take questions in the room. Um, we can take questions on Zoom. I can um, facilitate anybody in the Q&A. Any other questions in the room that we can?
I might just repeat for the people on Zoom. So Dr. Aurora um, congratulated for her uh, Martin Luther King University of Chicago honor. I'm not sure the exact title. And then we're just saying, as we recognize the history of Martin Luther King Day, how can we like keep the that history alive when it's you know kind of being attacked from all sides? Is um, I'm sorry, that was a very short summary of a very eloquent question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think um, the it's all hands on deck in everybody's work. All this is, and I, what I have found is fascinating is that like Netflix has gotten in the game, right? You know, they're making all these movies and documentaries and things about his, history in like an entertaining way um, that, you know, is, is another way of teaching outside of the, the classroom. And so I was like, and so when my kids were learning, uh, you know, the 13th and 14th Amendment, and I went back and was helping my son study, I had all this information. I was learning all these details, you know, the so and so, the Missouri Compromise. And I, I was with somebody in clinic, and I just felt like I had to share, you know, like this. Did you know about the Missouri Compromise? You know, <laughs> you, know you have this information, you want to share it. And they're like, no, I just, you know, but, um, but I say that to say, I don't even know what, but um, I think that, um, so everyone has a, a role to play. So that for me, what black people have always done is teach our own kids, our own history at night. I still, when my kids are 14, lay with them at bed at night before they go to sleep and talk about black history. And we read, you know, black history every night because they're not gonna get what they need in school. Um, and um, I think that we, you all have done a, a great job with like changing the way <clears throat> that the sixth floor looks, you know, intentionally. Um, and, you know, institutionalizing um, our current history, I think the more we can institutionalize um, things and make them not one-offs, but a true part of the curriculum as the curriculum is changing, um, it's a it's a great opportunity. Um, so, um, you know, and, and then the data supports so many things, you know, around patient-centered care, around, you know, environments that don't have implicit bias for all learners, you know, there's so much compelling data around racism harming us all, dragging us all down, right? Not just the marginalized, um, including the poor white people, right? But anyway, so I think that, um, Continuing, I, uh, what what fortifies me is like having my 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 various tribes, my my <laughs> in my band of warriors, um, um, and continuing to just to do the work in spite of, um, and continuing to fight until until we can't, and even when we're not supposed to. Um, I you know Martin Luther King always talked about, you know doing what is morally right, even if it's legally wrong. You know, because so many things have been legal that were wrong that we needed to change. And when Trump was in office, he was trying to make a number of things legal that were morally wrong. And right now we have some things that are legal that are morally wrong. 
And as physicians, we are going to eventually have to start making some very difficult personal choices that are political. Um, and so we have um, some tough roads ahead of us. Any other questions, thoughts? Great. Well, I just want to thank Dr. Peek again for a wonderful mm -hmm. talk. And I'll just remind you all that we are um, in our middle um, of the winter series. And we have um, the next few weeks will be virtual. Next week is um, a panel on allyship with Shika Jane and two of her uh, male colleagues. Um, and then um, Stella Safo is coming virtually um, about thriving in medicine, um, navigating adversity in healthcare the week after that. Um, starting on February 8th, we will be back in person. So two weeks virtual and then back in person for the rest of the winter quarter. So Dr. Humphrey um, and then Lady Ross is coming back. Monica Peek switched with her, but looking forward to having everyone there. But one last thanks to Dr. Peek for a wonderful talk. And then um, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll have the ethics fellows come down to the front. Um, let me do this recording thing first. Actually, maybe I'll let Bita, I'm actually, maybe I'll let Bita and Renata stop the recording so that doesn't um, record here. But if the ethics fellows want to come down to the front, we'll just have that same informal discussion with Dr. Peek that we have with the rest of the speakers. I think if I stop it here, it'll be more here. Um, I think that's yeah. not what okay. should happen, but let me, I mean, the recording thing is there, so I don't know. No, that I can. That's, you think that's not the recording? No, the recording can be used.